There were a group of undergraduate students at George Washington, right. at Georgetown right. University, George. excuse mm -hmm. me, who right. saw your story in yeah. Golf Digest, took right. up your yeah. cause, right. and eventually helped to exonerate you. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 major crimes solved by normal people. But this is the story of how blogger Joy Baker and survivor Jared Shirell never gave up. For this list, we're looking at the most puzzling criminal cases that were pieced together either in part or completely as a result of exceptional investigative work by regular citizens. Have you ever solved a crime? Let us know in the comments. Number 20. Victim's Friend Cracks a Cold Case in 1984, Angela Samota, a student at Southern Methodist University, was assaulted and stabbed multiple times, leading to her death. The man knocked at the door and he asked to use her restroom and her phone. She let him in, she called her boyfriend, and he knew something was wrong. With few suspects, the case quickly went cold until 2004, when Samota's best friend, Sheila Wysocki, claimed to have seen her ghost and was compelled to solve it. She hounded police with calls, but with no detective assigned to the case, barely any progress was made. Um, they were not receptive to me at all. I actually was very harassing to them, mm. and uh, they did not welcome me at all with open arms. Waisaki began studying and earned a certification as a private investigator. As a result, she was able to look at the case more closely and eventually helped police find related DNA evidence. This was linked to Donald Bess, a career criminal who was ultimately convicted and handed the death sentence. The people that talk about closure, they've really never been through something like that. So the fact that people are like, don't you feel better? Don't you, um, don't you feel some accomplishment? No, she's still dead. Number 19, the identification of the Grateful Doe. It was a mystery that left police puzzled for two decades. In June 1995, two men lost their lives in a car crash in Greensville County, Virginia. A young man was killed in a car crash in Emporia, Virginia in June of 1995. The only clues to his identity were a Grateful Dead t-shirt he was wearing, two tickets to a Grateful Dead concert, and a note written to a Jason. While the driver of the vehicle was quickly identified, the passenger's identity remained an enigma due to the Grateful Dead concert tickets found on him. He was nicknamed Grateful Doe. Authorities later released composite sketches of the passenger's face, which were widely circulated by internet sleuth groups. After this composite was released, photos of a man named Jason were recently posted to the Grateful Doe Facebook page in hopes of identifying him. As a result of this heavy campaign, the images were recognized by two people who claimed to be the passenger's former roommate and mother. After DNA tests were carried out, he was positively identified as 19-year-old Jason Callahan, who left home in 1995 and never returned. We were friends. We were always on a pleasant, hello, how you doing? What's going on? What you been up to lately? Number 18, the death of Paulette Jaster. Paulette Jaster was a young woman who disappeared from her town in Michigan in 1979. Apparently, Jaster had traveled miles away from home to Texas, where she was sadly killed the following year in a hit and run. With no form of identification found on her, police were unable to figure out who she was. At the same time, her family, hundreds of miles away, were left puzzled over her whereabouts. Her identity remained unsolved until 2014, when an internet user pointed forensic anthropologist Sharon Derrick in the direction of Jaster's family. Using her old pictures, Derek was able to confirm Jaster's identity with three distinctive freckles on her cheek, closing a case that had been cold for over three decades. Number 17, Margaret Davis solves her son's murder. Only a mother will know what it feels like to lose a child. This part of your soul that just goes out like that, and it's just filled with pain. English software engineer Stephen Davis was murdered by gunmen in his Makati, Philippines apartment in July 2002. His mother, Margaret, had a hunch that her son's wife, Evelyn, was somehow involved in his death. While the police investigation stalled and eventually turned cold, Margaret spent thousands of dollars hiring a private investigator. With all the evidence gathered from Margaret's investigation, the police gave the case a second look. Margaret's investigator carried out 24-hour surveillance on Evelyn. There were two men who paid regular visits to her home. One was Evelyn's lover. The other, his friend, another security man. 
It was ultimately discovered that Evelyn was having an affair with one of the gunmen and had masterminded the plot to have Stephen killed. This resulted in the conviction of Evelyn and all three gunmen in 2004. I loved you. I loved you. He loved you. Your children loved you. And look what's happened. I don't have anything to steal. Number 16. Jessica Maple and the Burglars after her late great-grandmother's house was burgled and robbed of nearly all its furniture, 12-year-old Jessica Maple cracked the case by finding key clues the police completely missed. Although officers had concluded that the burglar must have had a key to enter the house, Jessica discovered broken garage windows covered in multiple fingerprints when she returned to the crime scene with her mom. Her investigation also turned up all of the missing furniture at a nearby pawn shop, whose owner identified the men who'd brought them in. Why did you go to the pawn shop? Why would you go to the pawn shop? Well, I thought to myself, since it's a bad economy, people are going to want money. So instead of keeping the furniture, pawn shops, they give you money for selling them their, their stuff. Miss Maple didn't just stop there. She tracked down one of the burglars and got him to confess to the robbery. Talk about giving the cops a run for their money. Number 15. Susan Galbraith takes on a brutal murder. To solve the vicious murder of Jessica Curran, Kentucky resident Susan Galbraith first sent letters to several celebrities and journalists. She was, however, only able to grab the attention of BBC reporter Tom Mangold. Mangold traveled down to Kentucky and paired up with Galbraith. Their investigation soon led them to Quincy Cross, who Galbraith actually questioned, but was unable to get a confession from. When Mangold eventually returned home, Galbraith created a MySpace page, hoping to get information from the public. Soon after, a woman named Victoria Caldwell reached out to her and confessed to being an accomplice to Curran's murder. Caldwell reached a plea deal with the authorities, in which she named Cross as the killer and only spent six months in prison. Number 14. The Hit and Run of Carolee Ashby on Halloween night 1968, young Carolee Ashby was crossing the road in Fulton, New York, when she was run over by a car. My mom had a horrible life of grief and pain because of all of this. The driver refused to stop and disappeared into the night, never to be identified for decades. Fast forward to 2013, a retired Fulton detective put up a Facebook post about the cold case. This eventually reached a woman who recalled being asked to provide a false alibi for one Douglas Parkhurst back in 1968. Parkhurst was questioned by investigators back then, but it wasn't until recently that police say he admitted to driving drunk. After being provided with this information, police questioned Parkhurst and he confessed to the crime, but was spared of any charges as the statute of limitations had passed. Parkhurst will not be in court since the statute of limitations on most charges has long expired. The only criminal aspect would be an intentional act, and we have no information, no evidence to support that this was an intentional act. In a sick twist of fate, Parkhurst was killed five years later by another hit-and-run driver. Number 13. Car Enthusiasts Solve a Hit-and-Run The community of readers on the automobile blogging site Jalopnik put their expansive car knowledge to the ultimate test in April of 2012, when 57-year-old Betty Wheeler lost her life in a hit-and-run. Hoping to get some help from the online community, police uploaded a picture of a small piece of metal they believed had broken off the vehicle in the collision. And Jalopnik readers got right on it. They linked the metal to an early 2000s Ford F-150 pickup in a matter of hours. They gave police a piece of information that was critical in identifying the driver and passenger of the vehicle. Both men were later arrested and convicted of felony hit and run. Number 12. Yakov German tracks down a kidnapper and killer. The disappearance of the young Leiby Kletsky sent shockwaves through his Orthodox Jewish New York neighborhood. This is every parent's nightmare, but this type of incident is extremely rare. Those waves were certainly felt by Yakov German, a property manager who took it upon himself to find the missing boy. Yakov traced Leiby's movements using surveillance footage from stores and houses on his school route. This ended with footage from a car leasing company showing Leiby getting picked up by Levy Aaron, a man from the same neighborhood. We see somebody opening a door, kid going in, closing the door, a gold car. We see him from the other camera going back to the front of the car, going into a seat, and we see the car going out. Yakov's efforts led the police to the perpetrator. Police found only remains upon Aaron's arrest. Just two days after Leiby disappeared, 
Thousands of Hasidic Jews from across America gathered in Brooklyn to grieve the devastating and unthinkable loss of one of their own. Number 11, a Klansman gets his comeuppance. In 1964, two 19-year-old African-American students in Mississippi, Charles Eddie Moore and Henry Hezekiah D., were abducted and drowned by members of the KKK. The police investigation was allegedly clouded by their prejudice, and the case was closed after a few months. Some 40 years later, Moore's brother Thomas teamed up with a documentary filmmaker. They tracked down the man responsible for the killings, James Ford Seal, who was initially reported dead. Their case did not come to the forefront like the New Yorkers, uh, civil rights workers. Yeah. Ben Cheney was also amongst them, but the people they really wanted to, to solve the crime for was Schwerner and, and Goodman. Yeah. Uh, they didn't have the, the Dean Moore case didn't have the benefit of those people associated with the case. So. Uh, I took it up and found Thomas after about a year of looking for him. Thomas's and producer David Ridgen's discovery allowed the case to be reopened, resulting in Seal's arrest and conviction by a federal jury. He was sentenced to three consecutive life terms and died in prison in 2011. Number 10, the murder of Maribel Ramos. 36-year-old Maribel Ramos was an Iraq War veteran living in Santa Ana, California with her roommate KC Joy. Ramos disappeared on May 2, 2013, and was reported missing by her loved ones the next day. While police investigated her disappearance, a friend posted details of the case on Yelp, asking users for any information. A few days later, Ramos's roommate Joy supposedly left a comment in the thread, in which he referred to the army vet in the past tense. As if to suggest his possible involvement in the disappearance, one user in particular voiced suspicions about Joy. Those suspicions came true in the following days, as Ramos's body was found, and Joy was later arrested and convicted of her murder. Number 9. Ellen Leach Helps Identify Greg May's Remains Greg May was a Civil War antique collector who shared an apartment with Doug DeBruin. May disappeared in 2001, and his antiques popped up afterwards at an auction house. This led police to arrest DeBruin, who, it was revealed, had been selling off May's collection. But with no sign of a body, prosecutors knew they didn't have a solid case against him. Then in 2005, a skull was found all the way in Missouri that puzzled authorities. They put together a facial sculpture from the skull, which was later matched with May's missing persons poster by Ellen Leach, a Home Depot cashier and online sleuth. I have solved eight cases to date. Um, the first one was in 2005, which was Greg May. With this, prosecutors were able to build an airtight case against DeBruin and eventually convicted him of the murder. Number 8. Celia Blay Catches an Internet Predator William Melchert Dinkle, a 47-year-old nurse from Minnesota, frequently posed as a 20-something-year-old woman in online chat rooms. He encouraged young, depressed adults to take their own lives, sometimes for his viewing pleasure. William's scheme was discovered by Celia Blay, a pensioner from England. Blay struck up a conversation with a teenager online and learned that she was being goaded by William. Sometimes it's, it's a serious and helpful and supportive site. Other times there are people deliberately trying to push others over the edge. Celia devised a plan with the teenager and was able to collect evidence against William, with which she convinced U.S. authorities to lay charges. He was stripped of his nursing license and sentenced to jail time for assisting and attempting to assist in the deaths of two people. William Melcher Dinkle had to come to this courthouse five minutes from his house to face the allegations, all because a woman thousands of miles away wouldn't give up. Number 7. Bradley Willman and the Predatory Judge in the late 1990s, Canadian private investigator Bradley Willman developed a Trojan horse disguised as a picture file, which he posted on several websites frequented by predators. Once downloaded, the file gave him unfettered access to the individual's computer. This allowed him to pore over their emails and other documents, then turn over important information to watchdog groups. His work culminated in the arrest of Ronald Klein, a California Superior Court judge who had an abundance of damning evidence on his computer. Klein was disbarred and sentenced to 27 months in prison. Number 6. The Exoneration of Valentino Dixon 
in 1991, Valentino Dixon was arrested and charged with the fatal shooting of a man in Buffalo, New York. There's nothing quite like a fresh start. Thank you. Just ask Valentino Dixon. Although the actual shooter was said to have confessed and eight eyewitnesses reportedly absolved Dixon of the crime, he was eventually convicted and given a lengthy sentence. While in prison, Dixon began drawing golf courses and soon got noticed by a golf magazine journalist named Max Adler. I'm glad that resonated with him, with what he was feeling, and that he had the, the audacity to reach out to me, and I'm just so thankful I got that letter. Adler published an article on Dixon's ordeal that in turn caught the attention of Marty Tankliff, a Georgetown University law professor who decided to take up his case alongside his students. The class was able to poke holes in Dixon's original trial and helped secure him a new trial that ended in his exoneration. It's indescribable. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm so grateful for the support mm -hmm. and the love. You know, I never knew that I had this much support. When I walked out of that courtroom and everybody was there, <laughs> wow. I had some support, but I didn't know it was this huge. Number five, the murder of Abraham Shakespeare. For Abraham Shakespeare, winning a $30 million lottery was unfortunately the beginning of his troubles. Shakespeare bought himself that new car, a fancy new house, and lots more. But as so often happens, this lotto winner's drama didn't stick to the script. That's because the money also brought unwanted attention. He started a private business with Doris Didi Moore, who took control of his finances. A few months later, Moore killed Shakespeare and buried him under a concrete slab behind her house. As the case garnered attention, users of the internet crime forum Web Sleuths started digging. In the beginning, we thought he was missing, that he was hiding away. As the investigation continues, the evidence mounts that he could have died because of sinister means. Murder, we're talking here. Could be. They found that Moore had opened a fake account on the website to divert suspicion away from herself. The amateur sleuths were able to trace the IP address of the fake account back to Moore's personal computer, aiding investigators. Moore was found guilty of killing Shakespeare and received a life sentence. Cold, calculated, cruel, they all apply. Manipulative, probably the most manipulative person that this court has seen. Number four, a true crime writer solves a 50-year-old case. In 2016, Monica Weller released Injured Parties, solving the murder of Dr. Helen Davidson. The book details her seven-year journey of apparently closing a 50-year-old case. Back in 1966, Davidson was found dead close to her home in Buckinghamshire after going bird watching. Despite an extensive investigation, police were unable to come up with anything concrete and eventually ruled the crime a, quote, random motiveless killing. Weller, however, carried out painstaking research and soon concluded that the perpetrator was George Garbutt, a gardener who worked in the area. Although Garbutt took his own life five years after the incident, Weller theorized that he had killed Davidson after she spotted him with a male lover. This was at a time when homosexuality was still illegal in England. Number three, the murder of Jacob Wetterling. In October 1989, Jacob Wetterling was abducted in St. Joseph, Minnesota and never returned. These are happy thoughts, um, but when you stop to think about how much time has gone by, it's, um, it's kind of hard to swallow. The case bore similarities to the earlier abduction and assault of one Jared Shirell, who was ultimately freed. Wetterling's case grew cold over the years, until 2013, when Shirell teamed up with Joy Baker, a blogger, to solve it. This morning, Patty Wetterling finally knows what happened to her son, Jacob. Baker unearthed a string of similar assaults that occurred in nearby Painesville and was convinced that they were all likely committed by the same person. Although police reportedly discredited their theory at first, they eventually looked at the case keenly and zeroed in on Danny Heinrich. You had the theory and everybody told you that theory was wrong. Yeah, that's true. And it was disheartening. Heinrich, who was actually an early suspect in all aforementioned cases, led police to Wetterling's remains and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Number two, Michelle McNamara's hunt for the Golden State Killer. He was like a Hannibal Lecter, highly intelligent, highly sadistic, 
master manipulator. Joseph James D'Angelo, infamously known as the Golden State Killer, was responsible for the deaths of at least 13 people. However, the hunt for his identity would go on to claim one more life, that of Michelle McNamara. McNamara, a true crime writer, grew up fascinated with unsolved mysteries and later zeroed in on a string of cold cases that took place in California in the 70s and 80s. Her unyielding investigation turned up a library's worth of evidence. I'm so sad and full of self-doubt, and then I'm not. Where, where can this all lead? To deal with the stress, she started taking a cocktail of prescription drugs, which led to her accidental death. However, her work revived interest in the case and ultimately led law enforcement to D'Angelo. Police say the 72-year-old appeared surprised when they swarmed his home Tuesday evening. No incident, he didn't say it wasn't me or anything like that? No, uh, really no, really no conversation at all. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. The Murder of Jun Lin Before this case became about the murder of Jun Lin, it revolved around a couple of Facebook videos that portrayed acts of animal cruelty carried out by an unidentified man. And so I was on Facebook one day and I found a post. A lot of people have been feverishly posting about a video that was online. A group of online sleuths began investigating and were able to identify the man in the videos as Luca Magnata. Magnata later lured Lynn, a university student in Canada, over to his apartment, where he murdered him and uploaded a video online. It was no longer a game of online, this was real world. The sleuth group was able to link that video to the ones involving animals and share their information with the authorities. A few weeks later, Magnata was arrested. They finally caught him. And it was just like the perfect way for Luca to go down. Luca was caught in an internet cafe because he couldn't stay away from his vanity. Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.